Psalm chapter 90 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Of course, there was a time when there were no mountains. There never was a time when there, were no, when there was no God. He's from everlasting to everlasting. And when you look at the mountains, it ought to remind you, that they've been there for a long time. Yes, but God is eternal. In fact, the mountains really teach us a lot of lessons. Uh, I looked in, in, at a concordance and saw that there are mountains, the word mountain is found more than 500 times in the Bible. The first mention, I think, of the word mountain is in Genesis about the flood. The, the, the world was so wicked that God sent a terrible flood to destroy the sinful world. Only Noah, who believed God, was faithful and God spared him from the awful judgment. But here's what it says about the mountains. God sent a flood that covered all the high hills, the whole earth, and then it says, and the mountains were, were covered. The highest mountains on the world covered by the waters of a flood. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Some mountains are, oh, I think about um, maybe eight or nine kilometers. The highest mountain in the world is, I think, more than eight kilometers high. Can you imagine water covering the top of the highest mountains? And at the end of the flood, the mountains began to rise. I suppose the mountains before the flood were lower. And the, but the, the face of the earth shifted. And uh, the, the mountains rose and the valleys sank, it says in another place, to the place that God had prepared for them. God says some other things about the mountain. But let me remind you, when you see the mountains, remember, they were underwater. It's no surprise then. That, you, that archaeologists will find seashells way up in the high mountains sometimes. That's just an indication, just like the Bible says that all the mountains were under underwater. The flood covered the mountains. Now, let me tell you something else about the Bible says about the mountains. It was on a mountain that God gave his law to the world. Mount Sinai. It was a scary thing. The whole mountain was shaking. There was a fire. The earthquake. Thunder and lightning. And God came down on Mount Sinai and gave his law. Then, in the book of Psalms, it says, though, though the mountains be shaken into the heart of the seas, we'll still trust God. God is our refuge and fortress. So if, even if the biggest things come crashing down, we'll still trust God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea? The mountains are some of the strongest things on the world, but our trust better be in God. Then, another time, it mentions the mountains in Psalms. Lots of times. I'm just picking a few out. It says in Psalm 125, Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which abideth forever and cannot be moved. Just trust in the Lord and things... Uh, you can trust the Lord and relax through all the ups and downs in life. and Circumstances won't move you to turn away from the Lord. You're like the mountain. Immovable. And then in 
the book of uh, Psalms, excuse me, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 52. It says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who carry the gospel of peace, carry good tidings. If you've done some much walking, you know it's pretty tiresome hiking on the mountain. Uh, we right, right here in Musenberg, here in Cape Town, we live right real close to the mountains, just a couple of kilometers or so from our house. And we've climbed up the mountains, and, and uh, you, get, you know, get tired and sweaty and hot after a while. And I was talking about people who climb the mountains to carry the good news of salvation. And it says, how beautiful are their feet. God thinks the feet of the feet are, are, pe people's feet are pretty if they're carrying God's word. Mountains ought to teach us some of these, remind us of some of these lessons. And then the book of Zechariah, near the end of the Old Testament, he says, "Who art thou, O great mountain? Before God's servant, you'll become a plain." Hey, are you one of God's servants? Are there obstacles in your way? You just trust the Lord and do right, and God can move those, make a plain a flat field where there used to be a mountain. In fact, Jesus said something like that in the New Testament. He said, if you just had a little tiny bit of faith, just like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And it would happen and nothing would be too hard for you. Nothing would be impossible. You see, let me say again, the mountains are a symbol of the strongest, most enduring things on the world. Yeah. But if you have just a little faith, uh, you could say to a mountain, be moved and be cast into the sea. When we see things in nature, they ought to remind us of what God has said about those things. It was on a mountain that Jesus was tempted. Jesus was led of the Spirit out into the wilderness. And there in the wilderness... The devil tempted him for 40 days. Three major temptations. And one of those temptations was the devil took him up on a very high mountain. And in a vision, Jesus saw all the kingdoms of the world. Let me just insert here. If you have a vision, it doesn't always mean it's from God, does it? Who gave Jesus this vision? Did. It was a temptation. In a moment of time, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. I don't care how, how high the mountains, any mountain you climb, you're not going to see all the kingdoms of the world. It had to be a supernatural vision that the devil gave to Jesus as a temptation. But it was up on a mountain. He saw all this. You know, the devil comes to us and tries to, if, we get, if, we'll, if we'll go his way, he, he, he would lead us to think that we'll have more things and we can enjoy more pleasure. Well, it was up on a mountain that the devil tempted Jesus. And Jesus, uh, he resisted the temptation. Resist the devil and he will flee from you, the Lord said. It was on a mountain Jesus would go and pray. It says, uh, Jesus went up into a mountain. He was there alone. He would pray. Now, we're, not everyone is, lives near the mountains, and not everyone can go up in the mountain to pray. It's a nice thing to get outside sometimes, to have your quiet time, your time alone with God. But Jesus would go up in the mountains so he could get alone. People would come to him, and he, he seemed to minister to people when they came to him, but there, you, sometimes you just have to get away. It sounds cruel sometimes and uncaring, but there's a bigger thing getting help from God in heaven and we need to get alone. I wrote a little book here called How to Have a Time Alone with God. A lot of people are trying to serve God without a time of daily secret prayer. They're trying to teach others without spending time alone with God meditating on his word, thinking it over reading it, studying it for themselves. Folks, you're not going to last long that way. It's not going to work so well. It's like trying to drive a car without petrol. You see, it's through God's word that we get power. It's through our, it's through our time with God that, that we will 
know him better and get his power and his blessing. Uh, let me say this. I forget to say it at the end. If you'd like one of these, uh, I'm not selling these. If you'd like one, just write to us or email us or call us, and I'll be happy to post you one. This has been a help to some people. I think it'll be a help to you as well. How to have a time alone with God. You see, Jesus went up on the mountain, a time alone with the Father. We learned some lessons. Jesus is setting us an example. Let me tell you something else about the mountain. When you see the mountains, it was on a mountain that Jesus went up with three of his disciples and was transfigured before them. They had been down through the villages and in, this, in the city of Jerusalem and among the people. And then he took those three, just those three, up on a mountain. And suddenly they saw Jesus in his glory. His face was shining. His clothes were white, whiter than anybody would be able to bleach them white. And with him were Moses and Elijah, two of the most powerful figures of the Old Testament great prophets, and the disciples saw it was up on a mountain that God showed the glory of his Son, and God said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It was on the holy mount, uh, Peter said, uh, over in his epistle, I think Second Peter, that God gave testimony to his Son. Jesus is the Son of God, and God spoke and gave testimony to that fact on the mount, the Mount of Transfiguration. And then just before Jesus was crucified, you know what Jesus did at night? He would go and stay up in the mountain. Not in a nice motel, not with some friends, not in his own mansion. Didn't have a mansion, did he? He just stayed there in the mountain alone with God. And then it was on Calvary that he was crucified. Now, Calvary's not a mountain. Sometimes we say Mount Calvary, but it's just a hill, just a little, a little than a mountain that Jesus was crucified. But some of the great events in history and some of the great events in the Word of God and some of the great events about salvation are centered around mountains. And then, after Jesus was crucified, he was buried, on the third day, he rose again, and then he sent word for his disciples to meet him on a mountain. And so they climbed up on the mountain, and there Jesus had one of the most important things to say to his disciples. He said, <clears throat> you go to all the nations, make disciples, baptize them, and teach him to do all the things I've commanded you to do. So Jesus was there up on this high mountain. He said, all power is given to me now, so you go make disciples. Now what's a disciple? A disciple is someone who's forsaken all to follow Jesus. That's the job Jesus gave these 11. Now that's the job he's given us. Now how do I know that's my job and your job? Well, I'll tell you why I know. One reason I know is, he said, go and make disciples and teach them to do all the things I've told you to do. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, even to the end of the world. Well, you know all those disciples have died centuries ago. So this command carries its force all the way to the end of the world, all the way to the end of the age. This great commission to go and make disciples is for us now, not just for those 11, 1,900 years ago. I'll tell you another reason I know that this commandment is for us. Jesus said, you go make disciples, he says to the 11. You go make disciples, and you baptize them, and you teach them to do the same thing that I've told you to do. So they were to go make disciples, someone who's forsaken all to follow Jesus, and then teach them to do all the things Jesus taught them. And then that meant they were to go make disciples, and teach others to do the same thing Jesus had told the apostles. And so that means everything Jesus told the apostles to do, everything he commanded them to do, we're to do as well, and we're to teach others to do them as well. Jesus told that all on a mountain. 
Now there will come a time when people are going to call out to the mountains to fall on them. That's pretty scary, but it'll happen. There will be such terrible judgments, and you can read about some of these in Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 16 and elsewhere. Even the powerful men, soldiers, as well as slaves, rich and poor, they're going to crawl into the caves and in the holes in the ground. And they're going to cry for the rocks to fall on them. Can you imagine some of those big rocks in the mountains come rolling down with thunderous uh, noise and come and crush a house? Well, that would be terrible. Yeah, but they'd rather have that to happen than to have to face the Lord. Because the Bible says there will come a time when they're going to cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them. And when you see a mountain, that ought to be a reminder of what the Lord says will happen. There will be a time of judgment on this world. People have been careless about God's word and about things he's commanded. And they think, well, you know, nothing bad has happened to me. And uh, everybody's doing this. Uh, you just watch. Well, those mountains ought to be a reminder to you. They're going to cry out to the mountains, fall on us, and the hills cover us. It says also in the book of Revelation, there will be a great earthquake. It will be such a bad earthquake, earthquake that, the, that the islands will disappear. The mountains will not be found. Now, here in Cape Town, especially in Musenberg, where we live, if those mountains come crashing down, I don't know what's going to happen to our houses. <laughs> uh, it's going to happen, though. The mountains will not be found. I'll tell you something else that will happen in the, in the future. The Bible speaks about mountains. When Jesus comes back, that same Mount of Olives, there in Israel, there at Jerusalem, where Jesus would go before he was crucified, he would go there, spend the night in the Mount of Olives, He's being rejected by his own people. He's so lonely. And this awful foreboding and sense of dread about the awful, horrible things that are about to happen. He was alone there, awaiting the time of his arrest and, and torture and, and execution. Jesus is going to come back to that same mountain, the Mount of Olives. And when he does... The book of Zechariah says, let me just read. It's Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave, split, in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. And half the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. The Mount of Olives will split. There will be a valley between the two halves, south and north. Hey, Whenever you see a mountain, there's some things that ought to remind you. It ought to remind you that God will judge the world. He did before the floods were above the highest mountains. It ought to remind you that God is the lawgiver and he, he has the right to tell us what to do. He came down on Mount Sinai and gave us the Ten Commandments. Scary time, thunder and lightning and an earthquake and the mountain was shaking. By the way, I didn't mention this. Moses went up on the mountain and he viewed the promised land. Hey, there will come a time at the end when the new heaven, there will be a new heavens and a new earth and the holy city will come down from God out of heaven and in the book of Revelation chapter 21, John watched it happen. He was way up on a mountain and he saw this new Jerusalem coming down. Tells how big it was. Huge. <coughs> many, many, many times bigger than the largest cities on the world today. About more than 2,000 kilometers long, more than 2,000 kilometers wide, and more than 2,000 kilometers high. I think that's why it's called Mount Zion. The Bible says, who's going to dwell in, Mount, in the God's holy mount? I believe he's talking about that heavenly city. Huge. 
2,000 kilometers long, wide, and high. Who's going to live in that holy city? And it tells he that has clean hands and a, oops, <laughs> clean hands. Am I a good one to be talking about clean hands? Well, I think you know what he's talking about. I've got uh, uh, dirty hands right now because of my work for the Lord, my chalk. And I'm pretty sure Jesus had dirty hands sometimes as a carpenter. But the word, the term clean hands, I think it's talking about doing right with your hands. And if you've done wrong, get it right. He has clean hands and a pure heart. He's not lifted up his soul to vanity nor sworn deceitfully. He's honest in his dealing with others and is honest in his own mind and heart with the Lord. That's, and he's the one who has received righteousness from God. He has not trusted his own righteousness. He's received the free gift. Justification. God has declared him righteousness by his mercy. That's the kind of person who's going to live in the great Mount, Mount Zion, that beautiful golden city, Mount Zion, with the wall of jasper around it and precious stones in the foundation. So when we see mountains, I want to remind us of some things. Uh, Jesus talked about how God will take care of us. All, all things th throughout, th throughout nature ought to remind us of things in the Bible. When you see flowers, you ought to remember that God, will, the same God who clothes the lilies will give us the things we need, clothe us. I was reminded of that recently. I, I, wear, I have big, big feet, and uh, it's kind of hard to find uh, clothes to, uh, shoes to, my size, and I was in Zambia, and uh, they, they, they gave me a nice pair of new shoes. In fact, I'm wearing them right now, uh, and a nice pair of boots. I don't know where they could find. I was so, so surprised that they could find my size there. It's just a reminder of how God has provided for me ever since I was a little boy. He knows my size, and as you see things in nature, it ought to remind you that God uh, the, the lessons in the Bible. See the lilies and the flowers. I want to remind you of how God will take care of you. So when you see the mountains, they seem so big and strong. It's all right. If you're trusting Jesus, you'll be like the mountains, Mount Zion that abides forever. God won't take his mercy away from you. The mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness will not depart. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed from you, the Lord says. And let's don't forget to use our feet to bring the good news to other, others. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who bring good tidings of peace, carry the gospel. And if something's in our way, hey, God can move it. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before God's servant, you will be like a plane. You have just a little tiny bit of faith, like a grain of a mustard seed. You can say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. Nothing will be impossible to you, Jesus said. And then there will be a greater mountain than anything we've ever seen. And the heavenly city comes down, Mount Zion. And before that time comes, if you're not ready, you're going to be in trouble. You'll be calling for the mountains, and the hills, and the rocks to fall on you. The time to get ready is now. And the way to do that is to trust Jesus. On a little mountain, on a hill, Jesus died on the cross for us. He paid the price. You'll turn to him, you can be safe. And if you've received his forgiveness, remember what Jesus said on the mountain? Before he ascended into heaven, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. He said, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Let's make disciples and teach them to do everything Jesus said. That's what Jesus said on the mountain. I want to ask you to do something for us. If you think about us, would you pray for us? as we're uh, broadcasting on TV regularly, if you'll pray for us, it'll help us.